Hey everyone, you're listening to the 107 Podcast, where we get together every fortnight, and sometimes more often, to talk about technology, business, and the humans in it. I'm your host, Ivan Stegich. My guest today is Mary Jo Hoffman, creator of Still at stillblog.net, a blog that posts one image daily of gathered nat- natural objects. It's been described as a place to stop, a place to look at one thing at a time, a place to be still. I think this is definitely something we need in this day and age of tweets and snaps and TikToks. Mary Jo used to be an aerospace engineer at Honeywell before becoming a full-time creative and spends her time here in the Twin Cities of Minnesota, but apparently also in France. I want to know so much more. Hi, hello, welcome to the show, Mary Jo. It's so great to have you on the podcast. Hello, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a thrill. So you graduated from Stanford with a Master's of Science in Aerospace, Aeronautical, and Astronautical Engineering. Can you tell me more about where you grew up and why you enrolled in such a prestigious program? I, I sure can. It, it's... Yeah, I, I will. I'll tell you, it's a, it's a typical path and, a, and, a, and an unusual path at the same time. Mm-hmm. I, um, I actually grew up in the Twin Cities. I actually grew up in the same suburb, Shoreview, in which I live now. I moved back to the place I grew up in when I was in my 40s. But um, I went to undergraduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And it's very, it, it is, it's an interesting story because... I was always good at math and science, but it was back in the day when kids didn't, do you, you may remember, nobody knew each other's GPA. Do you remember that era? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you had no yeah. idea what the GPA of your friends were, let mm-hmm. alone your own GPA. And, and so I grew up knowing that I was good at math and science, but not having any idea of how good at math and science I was. All I knew is that it was fun for me. It felt like solving puzzles. Um, I got my homework done quickly, usually on the bus on the way home. Mm-hmm. And so I could go out and play when I was done. And so I never thought much of it. My parents didn't think much of it. And then one day in high school, a physics teacher, and yeah, I was taking calculus and I was taking physics because honestly, they were more easy for me than taking history or poli sci, which was what my friends were taking. I feel ya. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. And then one day at physics, there, the, my high school had two physics teachers. And um, one of them that didn't even have me in his class pulled me aside in the hall and he said, where are you going to school? I said, Madison. And he said, what are you going to study? I said, I have no idea. And he said, think about, why don't you think about engineering? It's a, it's a college that's easier to get into. It, you know, when you enter college, and if you don't like it, you can drop out. And if if you do like it, you know, it's easier to enter as a freshman than try and transfer into it as a sophomore or junior. So I took his advice and I went to Madison. I entered the College of Engineering. And um, it turns out that, you know, in a school the size of Madison with 40,000 students, you quickly, you know, each my my physics classes, my chemistry classes, my math classes, they, they had 500 students in them, you know, mm-hmm. and it quickly found out just exactly how good at math and science you are by the curve, you know, the yeah. bell curve of 500 students. Suddenly, suddenly you got real time feedback on, 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 on what your chops were. And it turns out I was quite good at math and science. And so I stayed in engineering and I, I you know, considered all the different kinds and aerospace appealed to me the most. So, you know, I was never a kid that grew up wanting to be an astronaut or fascinated with uh, rockets or satellites or anything like that. It was really an aptitude thing. I was, I enjoyed the science and I enjoyed doing the science that was the requirement for that field. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And and how did it end up that you went from Madison over to the West Coast and did the master's at Stanford? I was born in 1964, so it's the last year of the baby boomers. I'm considered Mm. that tail or the cusp of the baby boomers. But if you remember, that was the Reagan era. Mm -hmm. 
and there was a lot of defense spending. Mm. And so aerospace companies were hiring. And so when I left college in 1987, I probably had eight job offers. Wow. And I probably had nine interviews. I mean, everyone was hiring. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the age old story, it's embarrassing to say, but I came back to Minnesota because of a boyfriend Mm -hmm. and Honeywell was one of those offers. And I actually took it. Now, Honeywell, people don't associate Honeywell with aerospace, but uh, one third of Honeywell's business was uh, aerospace related and it was avionics. So all of the electronics that go in almost all of our aircraft, most most uh, most of the commercial aircraft, most of the U.S. Air Force aircraft, most of the satellites, they are predominantly Honeywell avionics. It's it, the electronics of the guidance, navigation, and control. It's called avionics, and that's um, made by Honeywell. So Honeywell was one of those job offers, and I came to Honeywell right out of undergraduate, and I was hired into the research center. But after working for a year, I with just an undergraduate in research, I realized I wanted more chops. I was mostly PhDs and stuff that I was working with. So I applied to graduate school and got into Stanford. I applied to, what do I apply to? Only two schools, University of Washington and Seattle, because that's where Boeing is. Boeing, yeah. Yep, and then I applied to Stanford because I thought it'd be cool to live in California. (laughs) It was that naive, that simple. Nobody, you know, it was back in the era where parents didn't coach you. No, but you know what I mean? You just, nobody gave you, nobody was pushing you. Everything was self-driven. And I just thought California sounded cool. It also had, um, we did research, was at, in the research facility at Honeywell. And so a lot of my coworkers were PhD'd and a lot of, several of them had come through that Stanford program. You know, I had that whispered in my ear, but... Um, I really applied based on location. And then, you know, and there, there aren't that many aerospace programs in the country. You know, there's probably only a dozen or so, usually located where there's an aerospace industry. And there is an aerospace industry in, in the um, Bay Area. Uh, NASA Ames is located there. So, you know, the, in Seattle, Southern California, Texas, and then Honeywell, Minneapolis, so and then some on the East Coast. So anyway, I applied to Stanford. Again, I was really good at math in an inexplicable way. You know, I took that GRE and I got 98th percentile in math. Wow. And, you know, I think I tested 70th percentile in English. <laughs> and I'm a native <laughs> English speaker. <laughs> I mean, you know, it just was I had a... I had a spiky talent, you know, this one talent for applied mathematics. It's a, it actually sounds a lot like what happened to me. I don't know if you know that I worked at Honeywell as well. Oh, you know, I did know that. And so, yeah, tell me your story. So, well, this is all about you, of course. Uh, I just wanted to point out that you may have known some of the people that I worked with. My first boss was Earl Benzer. And oh, I was yes. at oh, yes. I was at Honeywell Technology Center in Plymouth. Is that is that the location you were in, or or were you in the the one in Camden? Nope, I was in the one research in center, the one up on on the river there, on the Mississippi River, off of off of um, St. Anthony Parkway. Oh, right, with the chi- with the chimney, with the chimney that has the bricks and the. the no, that and... that's this. That's the that's the Honeywell division, the facility that makes the navigation system. So it's oh. ring laser gyros. No, the research center, we had our own building. We were considered ivory tower. You know, uh. we, it was more <laughs> like a university research center than it was a, a corporate research center. Wow. Yeah. So essentially the same thing that happened to you, I, I assume you went back to Honeywell after you were done with your master's at Stanford. I should tell the story of getting the master's at Stanford yeah, because please do. Please I think do. it people would be curious to hear it. I, I I put myself through undergraduate college and came out with student loans. I worked, you know, in it, in addition to doing my engineering degree, I worked probably probably average twenty hours a week um, at least, but sometimes mm-hmm. thirty. I would put myself through college and then got out, went to work. I had student loans, so I had to you know take a well-paying well, job, and then. Mm-hmm. 
I applied to graduate school and you know, I already had at that time $30,000 of student loans, which today would probably be about $100,000 mm -hmm. of student loans. And um, got accepted to Stanford. This is all very interesting. I called Stanford and I said, do you give financial aid for a master's program? And they, I, I honestly, rem I remember it as a chuckle. It's hard to believe that they did actually chuckle, but I remember them sort of saying, Oh, no, no, no. You, if you want to come to Stanford, you find your funding. Wow. What I learned later was for, for master's degrees, they don't give funding. But if you tell them you're going in as a PhD student, then they'll find funding for you. Interesting. I didn't know that game. And mm. so I told them I was only coming for a master's. And so, so I went to Honeywell and said, I got accepted to Stanford. I can't afford Stanford. Can you guys help me out? And Honeywell said, you know, no, the policy is we pay for graduate school if you work while you're doing it. And that's for most Honeywellers, that means you're going to the University of Minnesota. And so you have to work part time and go to school part time and we'll help pay for your college tuition. And I said, well, you know, I want to do this program. I'm, I'm not going to work um, it is, you know, pre Presume, you know, I mean, yeah, you couldn't work yeah. from, you couldn't work from California. And it was the very beginning of email back then, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, anyway, um, they said no. And I asked, and then I asked, and then I deferred a year. I deferred my acceptance a year. And then I asked again and they said no. And then I applied for a, 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 a scholarship and they gave, I got, I won a little scholarship. It was this crazy scholarship out of New York city. Um, it was a little bit of money and I went to, back to Honeywell the third time. And I said, I'm going to have to turn down this scholarship unless you guys can help me go to Stanford. And then my boss essentially took me aside and said, okay, we're going to give you money, but don't you tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, wow. yeah, he said, the policy is if they go to Minnesota, you know, and work part time, you get reimbursement. But he said, we, we can't open Pandora's box here. So we are going to give you money. Don't tell anyone. We expect you to come back, mm. but, you know, handshake agreement. Mm -hmm. And he said, and if anyone does ever find out, we're going to say it was because you were a female because I was the only female in the group. So, oh, wow. you know, that then it didn't have to be a Pandora, you know, then they didn't have to offer it to everyone. Right. So it was, it, but it took three times, you know, they said flat, no, the first two. And I, that's a, that's a message I want your, your folks to hear is that, you know, got to keep trying. You keep trying. I mean, you know, they, they were very polite about those no's, but they were just saying, we can't, we can't, you know, we can't afford to pay for everyone who wants to go to grad school. Right. Yeah. So, um, eventually they found a way and I went out and it was, so they, you know, they paid for that, that, that graduate program and. And I did come back and I worked for him for 15 years after that. What were your major challenges in transitioning back to working after you were out doing your, your master's and, and not being on campus at Honeywell? Well, you know, there wasn't much. You know, when I, I put myself through undergraduate, so when I went to Stanford, it was the first time I was a full-time student. Mm. It was the first time I ever lived in a dorm, actually. Um, so that's interesting because when I went to Madison, they weren't giving housing out of state students because there was a housing crunch. Um, so I had a, my first like sort of dorm full-time student experience when I went to Stanford. And then I came back and I went back into the same research group I'd been with and just resumed what I'd been doing. So there wasn't a hard transition coming back. I'd made my friendships and my, my relationships before I left and I just kind of stepped right back into them. So you were at Honeywell for about 15 years as a woman in engineering during, I would guess, the 80s and 90s, right? So not exactly corporate culture that's that's conducive to female engineers. Yeah, it was all in the 90s. So late 80s to the early, you know, early uh, 2000s. Yeah, um, it was, yeah, you know, I, I you would think I'd have a lot to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't, I honestly, you know, I, I should, I should think about it. I really should, because I should have a lot to say about that. I was often, very often the only woman in the room. Um, but it wasn't, I wasn't that aware of it. I was a real tomboy growing up. Um, 
I'm still a tomboy. I'm 56 years old. I'm still a tomboy. I mean, I just, I was just one of the team. It didn't occur to me that I was a woman. I didn't feel like I was treated like a woman, you know, any differently. There was one incident in that 15 years where I was pulled aside and my boss gave me a fairly sizable, um, you know, mid, mid cycle, mid financial cycle, gave me a fairly sizable rate. And, you know, it was like, 13% or something. Mm. I don't remember. And he, and I said, what's this? Cause it wasn't the time for annual raises. And he said, uh, HR just looked at equal pay and based on your performance ratings, you've been underpaid compared to your peers. Wow. By 13%. I don't remember. It was sizable at the time. And, you know, I was like, great, free money. But then it did occur to me like, okay, how long have I been mm -hmm. underpaid <laughs> compared to my peers? Right. Because you're not offering back pay. But anyway, I think what was great to me, I mean, I quickly got promoted. I it went, I moved up the engineering ranks very fast and then very quickly into management and then very quickly. By the time I left in 15 years, I was director of a the lab that I was hired into, I had hundred employees in three countries. Um, you know, Honeywell gave me a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. and they, you know, didn't hold me back in any way. Mm -hmm. So, um, the fact that maybe for five years I'd been underpaid compared to my peers was just, it, you know, it, it, it's a data point. It's interesting, but it, you know, I, I made up with that for that with, you know, quite a lot of promotions and opportunity. What was the inflection point that led you to say, I am done with engineering and now I'm going to take photographs and be a creative and sell those photographs on the internet? Yeah, that is, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a good question. And there it's, it's very, as you can imagine, it's very multifaceted. Mm -hmm. So by then, so I had been promoted quite quickly and part of it was, um, you know, people that get PhDs and get do research, they don't, they don't want to do management. And a, a big part of a you, if especially you, if you you'll remember, a big part of the manager's job was to find work. Yeah, it was like, how do I get that DARPA funding? Oh yeah, to go to DARPA, to go to 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 go to clients and explain to them the talents of your group and you know, have them either team with them to bid for government contracts or to, you know, have them hire you as a subcontractor. And so really it was almost like a very, very highly specific technical marketing job. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, that, you know, most people that get PhDs, they want to do technical work. And so they're very happy to not have to go do sales to, you know, sell themselves to clients. So the fact that I was willing to do that on their behalf, I mean, it was very interesting because I became a manager of the group. So I would have, my first management position would I had 15 engineers in my group. And I was younger than all of them by 15 years. You know, I was probably 30 years old and they were all in their mid forties, but they were not in any way resentful that they were reporting to a woman nor that I was so young because I was willing to do a job that none of them wanted to do which was go talk to clients so you know what happened is I was willing to do it I turned out to be really good at it and I got you know promoted 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 so um after 15 years, though, I, kept, I was traveling so much. I, I remember turning to my favorite boss that I'd ever had in my years at Highwell, John Wayrock, and I said, you know, at that time I was now 35 years old, and I said, I wish I had this job at 55 because of all this travel, and I want, I need to start, a, I want to start a family, mm. and I can't be traveling this much. And I said, I think at 55, I would love to be traveling this much, you know. Um, so anyways, what it, 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 there was a point, there was a convergence of things that happened after 15 years. A, I wanted to start a family. Um, B, Honeywell had just been, tried to be acquired by General Electric, which had failed. 
due to antitrust. And then two years later, it was then successfully acquired by Allied Signal. Allied Signal, I remember that. That was around the time I left as well, actually. And that was, I was then, you know, by then I was now um, director of, you know, a director of a lab. And those years of acquisition were really stressful on the employees. Really stressful. And as, you know, in a stressful work environment, it brings out the worst of people's behaviors, you know. So the work environment got... It wasn't as fun. It had been kind of a golden era in the 90s. Um, there was lots of government funding. We all liked each other. We were doing, we were, and our particular group was the best in what we did in the country and we knew it and everybody knew it. Um, so it was this little golden era of research. And, um, and then, you know, Honeywell was, you know, attempted takeover by GE. And then when we were finally acquired by Allied Signal, the air just sort of let, was let out of the balloon. It just, Allied Signal was a conglomerate and in sort of a non-specific, really, you know, really wide net industrial conglomerate, like nothing very sexy. <laughs> yeah. And people that worked at Honeywell were really proud of the work they did. And it turned out that you know, Allied Signal wasn't, it was one of these companies that um, was built on the model. The only thing that matters is earnings per share. And every quarter, the earnings per share have to go up, and that's all that matters. And in, in, when that message got delivered to our, our 500 engineers in the research center, it just was, it was just the end of an era. People... We cared about the work. We didn't care about earnings per share. I mean, we didn't care about, it was the work that mattered. People worked incredible amounts of overtime without pay. Mm -hmm. You know, it was that kind of environment because they loved the work. So anyways, Allied Signal came along. The work, the environment changed. The work was no longer fun. And um, I was also needing to start a family. And so uh, quite honestly, I we had, we had a daughter, our our first daughter by then, and I was having trouble having our, a, a, another child. And actually, started working with a fertility doctor who suggested I quit work. And so the, she said, "You know, we can't help you because there was nothing physically wrong." And she said, "My only la my last and only suggestion is um, you try quitting work." And it was, you know, the environment had changed. And I said to my husband, if, I, if we don't try, I'll always regret it. So um, those things converged. But the, the interesting thing, one, one more thing, I'm going on long, but this is very interesting. I think it matters because it was this era of, of this does have to do with being a female. I had been fast-tracked and, and tapped, you know, to, to go into executive management. And so when I announced I was leaving, um, I got, I got called into a room with a bunch of executives, a bunch of presidents and vice presidents. And they said, it was, first of all, it was the most ridiculous meeting. They're all sitting in a semicircle and I'm like in the middle of the semicircle. So Ugh, awful. It was awful. It was ridiculous. And they said, and it was meant to retain me, you know, that that was the point of the meeting. And, and, it, and they they called me into the room and they said, you know, why are you leaving? We we had we had you know we had plans for you. And it, by then it was very much about fertility. And I sat there and I and I thought to myself, here's a bunch of men. <laughs> I knew them all because I'd interacted with them. They were all divorced. They were all not on good terms with their own children. Um, they were all on second or third marriages. Um, there were none of them role models, right? And I sat and I said to myself, do I tell them the truth? Do I tell them it's fertility? Do I, what do I say? You know, and don't burn your bridges. You got to come back. This is all going through my head. You know, in case you need to come back, don't burn any bridges. I'm, I'm just sitting there looking at them. And I, I don't even remember what I said. I think I said, I think I told them that we were trying to have a, a child and that this was you know, this is what the doctor recommended. But the interesting thing is 
by the time I left, I was senior, I was, what, I was 38 years old, maybe, mm -hmm. and I was on several national boards for aerospace. Mm -hmm. You know, I would, I was flying to Washington DC regularly to consult about how the government should fund aerospace research. You know, I mean, I was, my, my Stanford aerospace graduate peers were now directors and vice presidents of, at Boeing, at NASA. You know what I mean? I was well connected in the community. And let's, you know, we're going to get to France, but let's remember that by the time I left, there were only two airframe builders, Airbus and, and Boeing. And Airbus is located in Toulouse, France. Mm -hmm. And everybody knew that my husband and I had a love affair with France. So, um, I mean, they knew, like, yeah. you know, I was, I was perfectly um, steeped in this industry. You know what I mean? You know, I've, I've always felt like it was a lack of imagination on their part to let me walk out the door. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. Like they yep. should have said, go do what you need to do, but when you want to come back, call us. Or when you want to come back in any manner, even part-time, call us. But they didn't say that. They just said, okay. See you, you later. Know. See you later. I really feel, honestly, that it was just a lack of imagination. And, and they, it didn't occur to them that they could have done that. They could have offered that. And I think I would have come back. I would have come back in a part-time uh, manner. And they would have had the experience and everything that you had previously, even, even better, even Ooh, better. Professional network that, you know, the aerospace industry, one of the reasons, another, you know, one of the other things that contributed to me wanting to leave was it's a slow moving industry. Oh, it's super, you know, 30 years cycles of products. I mean, it takes seven years to do, to do flight testing on a, on a new piece of equipment, seven years. It's a long time. So it was one of those things that drove me crazy because it was a slow industry. At the same time, I've been out of out of Honeywell now for um, about that amount of time now, about 15 years. And my colleagues, I, they're still there. I still have a network, a professional network in the aerospace industry because it's a slow moving industry. And people stick around. People stick around and products stick around yeah. for 30 years. So Stability and reliability. Yeah. And so the fact that they let me walk out the door with all of that and not just say, come back, we'll make it work. I, I just felt like it's shame on them is all. And the, and the blog started after you left. And, and how is it related to France? You said that there was a love affair with France, but you left Honeywell, you worked on your family, and then this blog happened. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay. So the, when I left Honeywell, that the, another thing happened by then Allied had bought Honeywell and Allied Signals corporate headquarters were in Morristown, New, New Jersey. And I remember flying out to, to there. I had to fly out there all the time and, uh, 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 like an executive HR person called me aside and said, the, by the way, sort of enjoy this position now because this is the last position you'll have where you get to call the shots. After this, you're married to the company. What? They literally said that. That's awful. And I, I came home from that trip and I said, I'm not married to Honeywell. I'm married to you, Steve. You know, I'm married to my husband. Like, right. I like my job. I'm a hard worker, but I am not married to Honeywell. I'm married to my family, mm -hmm. you know? And it was the wrong thing to say to me at that moment. Mm. So um, anyway, um, so I, I leave. I leave Honeywell, um, and they they let me leave. And you know, I I don't. I kind of leave for good. I don't harbor any intention of going back. And then my husband, just like the fertility doctor predicted, we I got pregnant right away, and we had our son. <laughs> and yes, she was right. And um, so now I'm you know, a, a stay at home mom with two kids and, um, but used to work in full time. Mm -hmm. My husband and I, and my husband had been a stay at home dad with our, our, with our daughter. And we sort of, we, we, we like to say we high fived and switched roles, which is what we did. But of course that transition took like over five years. Right. I yeah. mean, 
he had only been working part time and then he ramped up to full time. And, um, and then, you know, I, um, you know, the, 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 I don't think we got parity in the like financial, you know, it was a step back financially for me to quit working, obviously. And that didn't, that didn't, um, that didn't, you know, we didn't get parity for a long time after that. But, um, but I, you know, where I went with that story about you're going to be married to, to Honeywell, I remember thinking, no, I want a life. I don't want a career. Right. I mean, I don't, at the end of the day, I want to have had a rich life, mm -hmm. not necessarily just a rich career. And so my husband um, and I had always, um, I, you know, again, I went into math and science because I was good at it, not because it was necessarily a burning passion. And what we were both passionate about was uh, um, creativity. So he's a writer. And I, at the, it was, you know, I would say now I'm a visual artist and my current primary medium is photography. So I was, you know, more into visual arts. He was into writing and, and those were, um, always sort of hobbies, but we always dreamed of an early retirement where we could do that more full time. Right. And that would be the thing that we carry then that you don't have to stop doing someday because it, you can be in, you can be a writer when you're 80. You know what I mean? Right. It's hard to be a software engineer when you're 80. So um, when when I quit work um, and became a full-time mom, and it, those first years of children are just overwhelming. And then, <laughs> I, and then you know, after like three or four years, I, it was when my son went into um, preschool. Um, I remember picking my head up and saying, okay, what do I want to do now? And um, I would always wanted to do visual art and what I happened to be best at, at it was photography and then um, my husband and I had actually taken the kids to southern France for um, by this time our, so my son is six and we put the kids in school in southern France and we went and lived there for six months how do you just pick up and do that that I, I don't get that you just you just do it <laughs> how, how can you do that I just went to France yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I am skipping over a lot of important details because I'm worried about time. But yeah, so my husband's work is seasonal. He does taxes and it's very, very intense from January till May. And then it's not intense. And he makes 90% of his income between January and May and 10% the rest of the year, you know, filing extensions for people and that kind of thing. So it's, he had seasonal work. And I wasn't working, you know, I was still a full-time mom at that point. And th th there's also one other, one other big, big um, thing I skipped over with the early college years. I put myself through college and I don't, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have foresight. It just stumbled into all this, but I really liked college. I had fun and I got through college at that time. I was borrowing $6,000 a year. And that paid tuition and living at Madison in those years. And so I was just, and suddenly I got out and I think my first job offer at Honeywell was like $35,000 a year. So I was used nope. to living on six and I was being paid 35. And for, I just kept living on six. Good for you. That's awesome. I, you know, it wasn't that I was super smart or about, you know, compound interest or anything, you know what I mean? Right. I wasn't doing any, you know, now today, you know, there's on the internet, you know, on the web, there's all sorts of groups that do financial independence stuff, you know, in the, in the, in the, you know, the ways to live severely below your, your means so you can do really early retirement. You know, I wasn't, my husband and I, you know, I just had been, I had put myself through college living on next to nothing. I continued to live like that for a good 10 years after I started making a professional income. And so I saved a lot of money young. Mm -hmm. And as you learn, compound interest is wonderful. Yes, yes. And yeah, so by the time we were middle age, we actually had some financial security, you know, not independence. Not financial independence, but enough financial security that we could go to France for six months. 
So that, and that's what led to that. So, you know, we'd always, we'd both been, I was a foreign exchange student in high school. My husband had lived in Paris for a year when he was a, a college junior. Um, you know, we had always been travelers. We always dreamed about those kind of adventures. We both had ambitions to be creative, but we were doing the very traditional suburban thing, you know, raising kids and, and, and working full time. And, but we always had those dreams. And then by the time we got into our forties, I wanted then to give the kids, we put our kids in French immersion school. And then I wanted them to, you know, go to school in France and go from just being conversational in French to being actually fluent in French. Mm. So that's what prompted the trips to France. So we were, so you're asking about what started the photography while we were in Southern France, we, the kids were in school and I had time for the first time really to really commit myself to creative work. And I just thought up a project. I'm going to take one photo a day of something in my environment. Um, I mean, there's a, you know, there was inspiration for that. I was following other bloggers. I, creative bloggers, they would look like they were having a blast sharing their work online. And I, I just felt like I want to be part of this community. These guys are having fun. And I'm here in France for six months. I can, what can I do? What am I good at? Well, I'm good at photography. I like, I walk the dog every day. We brought the dog to France. So I'll just find something on my daily walk. I'll photograph it and share it. And that's what still came from. And so it's a very modern um, it's really just simply still life nature photography, but I did it in a very, very modern aesthetic, very graphic, and it hit some kind of zeitgeist. And within six months of starting, Martha Stewart called and said, can we feature you in the magazine? And so it just, and it just snowballed from there. Wow. Martha Stewart calling, huh? You must have been beside yourself when that happened. Oh, I was, I was flabbergasted. I really, truly thought five people would look at my pictures. One of them would be my mom and one would be my husband. Um, I was doing it for myself. It was a creative outlet. I wanted to participate in the creative community online. And I felt like, you know, you can just kind of go in and follow, but I wanted to be a participant. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my work and I'll comment on other people's work. I wanted a place at the table is what I like to say. And so um, I really didn't think it, I just thought it was a sort of a personal creative exercise. Um, and it, but it hit a, hit a nerve and then it snowballed and then it got its own momentum. And then here I am eight years later and I'm still doing the same thing. I've been making an, one image a day for eight years. One image a day for eight years. Wow. That's amazing dedication. It's kind of like the crazy cat lady, yeah. What what does your routine look like? You must have a routine that that manages like when you take the picture and and like because you, you have to do it every day. Yeah, I it it's um every day and and I do when I know that I'm going to be traveling. For example, I was just out of town for two days. I will then bef if if I can, I'll do the I'll bring my laptop and a camera. If I can't, I'll I'll make extra images the days before I travel and preload them. I mean, I've been doing it for eight years and it's very, very infrequent that I actually preload. Most images are made that day. Um, like today's image was made today and I'll post it tonight. I haven't posted it yet. It will get posted before I go to bed and, um, you know, it'll be tomorrow's post. So, um, what does it look like? I, 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 t I, I find something in my environment, usually while I'm walking, um, sometimes it's when I'm driving. I've been known to pull over and roadsides are full of really interesting um, stuff. <laughs> um, sometimes I pull like, anyway, I, anywhere I find interesting things and then I bring them home um, and I usually photograph it on my kitchen floor because I have skylights in my kitchen and it's all natural lighting and it's on a white background. So I just use like poster board or tag board and... Um, and then, so I, you know, sometime during the day, I find something to photograph. I bring it home. At some point in the day, I'll photograph it, which takes another 15, 20 minutes. And then at, 
usually around dinner time, I'll edit the photos on Photoshop. I'll pick the one I'm going to post, and that's another 10, 15 minutes. And then right before bed, I post it to the blog so that it, it refreshes overnight. And I type a little something for each thing, and uh, that takes another 15 minutes. So it's like, it's like 15, 20 minutes, three, four times a day. And that's the beauty of it is that it fits in the cracks. Like I don't have to block out an hour and a half every day to do still block. Do you ever worry about repeating yourself or doing something that's been done before? Do you, do you not remember? Do you not care? Like how how do you feel about the pat your past work influencing your current work? Yeah, I don't I don't care. I I I posted recently this summer. I I like you know every spring fern the fiddlehead ferns come up and every spring I photograph them and I, I wrote I remember writing this spring when they came up I said I'm gonna keep photographing fiddlehead ferns until I feel like I've captured the essence of fiddlehead ferns you know what I mean like there's you know I've done cattails every year I've done fiddlehead ferns every year I've done you know there's certain things and then there, so there's the obvious things. There's, you know, you do lilacs in spring. You do, you know, um, you know, I don't know, burdock in, in, in summer, if thistles in summer or whatever. Those are obvious things. Of, co of course, fall, the fall leaves in fall. The, um, the more fun challenge of doing it now this many years is to take a whole fall and not do any leaves. Because they're mm. so, the leaves are so obvious. They're so loud. They're so in your face, right? You take a walk. They're everywhere. <laughs> you see red, orange, and yellow. That's what your eye goes to. You can't, you can, you, you, you can't not look, right? Yeah. So the, the interesting challenge is capture fall without doing the fall leaves, right? What else is going on in fall? Um, and then that gets fun again, right? That's a whole, you know, that, that can carry me for a while, right? Um, so I find, you know, nature just absolutely endlessly fascinating. I don't see ever running out of topics. Mm. I don't think I will ever maybe capture the essence of a fiddlehead fern unfurling. You know what I, you know, yeah. like there's just, it's an infinite, it's an infinitely inspiring. I, you know, that's, it sounds super cliched, but it's just the truth, you know. How has the pandemic affected your work and your walks and, and the things that you're doing? The, um, yeah, the interesting thing about the pandemic, I actually feel a little bit kind of guilty about it, is that it, um, I, I, you know, people are suffering and mm -hmm. people are suffering, you know, physically, but emotionally and financially. And for me, the pandemic has been, you know, the opposite, right? It's even more time for walks, even, you know, it doesn't change my, my financial picture. It doesn't, I don't have to worry about that. And so in some ways this it's slowing down and everyone slowing down has made even more, you know, even more time for me to do this thing I love. Mm -hmm. Because even though I'm, you know, what you'd call self-employed now, you know, people, when, when everybody's buzzing, everybody's busy, you get invitations, you're social, you feel, I very, very much like to be part of a community. Matter of fact, when I quit working Honeywell, the, the biggest thing I missed in the end was being part of a team. Yeah. Being part yeah. of a group of smart people trying to solve a problem. I really loved that. I loved that team creative problem solving. So in, in creative work, art, an artist being an artist is very solitary. It's extremely solitary work. So anyways, the pandemic has made it, you know, easier. There's more time. There's less demands. There's no social demands on my time. Um, so, you know, um, it, ha it really in some ways hasn't changed still. And still, you know, still doing the still blog, the creative is kind of immune to that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, and, and you've worked with such large brands as well, right? You've worked with Target and the Scottish National Opera in addition to Martha Stewart. And, and yeah, Martha Stewart. And, West Elm did uh, carry the, uh, made some 
I did work, I partnered with West Elm, I partnered with Target. Target put my stuff on bedding, West Elm put it on, made these cool, um, transparent, well, you know, uh, pictures. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just really led to one thing, from one thing to another. It, it, it just got this momentum of its own that I can't, I, I sort of, I still can't, I still can't explain it. And it's funny, it's, I've been doing it eight years and it's really, if you look at it, it's like this, what is, what's the deal? It's just some, you know, some dried flowers on a white background, but it's, there's a, it's a fun, there's, you know, I have, um, like 17,000 followers on Instagram. And so people know my work they, and they recognize it. And they'll, I'm getting constantly, it's like the, the, I call it the still police people out there saying, I saw this not, and it's not credited to you. Is it your work? You know, like they're, you know, they're <laughs> out there making sure I get copyright credit where yeah. it's due, you know, and you, they're usually right. You know, it is my work and I didn't get credited, but often every now and then, you know, it's not hard to re repeat what I'm doing. You know, every now and then it's like, no, that's not mine. You know, how, how how do you, so clearly you have had relationships with and have sold your photography to large companies, but you also license your photography to anyone who wants to really purchase it from the internet. Mm -hmm. um, how, how's it been dealing, what is it like uh, dealing, what are the differences between dealing with a large company and individuals? Is there anything that you've learned about dealing with big companies that perhaps you'd wished you had known earlier on when you first started the blog? Um, I guess you never really anticipated working with large companies and you have all this Honeywell experience, but there there must be something that's, that strikes you about that. Um, yeah, so I, I sell my images a lot. I mean, I, you know, probably every day I get requests for images now. Um, and I do sell to individuals, although I don't make that well known because it takes a lot of emails back and forth just to sell one image and I don't charge that much. So it's like not a very good use of my time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I really like working with professionals. Mm. My favorite people to work with are other designers because they know exactly what they want and they're very decisive. Whereas if I'm selling an image or a grouping of images to you know, Sarah in Omaha, you know, so there's a lot of, do you think this, or do you think that, or do you have anything similar mm. to this, or, you know, it's just not a good use of my time, and whereas the designer will come and say, you know, I, we want this four images for this project, and can you give us a price, and I just love it, you know, it's efficient, and, and, and I always actually love to see what they do with it, because they do very interesting things. Um, the, the big corporations of so West Elm and Target in particular, um, that was, they were fun to work with. I loved working with Target West Elm and, and they, they happened to come to me the same year. So I was working with both of them at the same time. And, uh, it, I had two bookend experiences. Target had me do all the design work and even down to, uh, working with the printers themselves. Oh, wow. West Elm kind of just more or less just asked me for the images and then they did all of the product design, you know, and kind of just told me what they were doing. And even though my name was on the product, right, this was, you know, they were going to brand it as by Mary Jo, Hoff, you know, still still by Mary Jo Hoffman, but they were really telling me what they were going to do. Whereas Target, you know, actually let me do the design. So it was two, two bookend experiences. I actually don't mind either. Um, I don't mind just selling the images and letting people do what they want with them if they're professionals. Um, but I did have a lot of fun working with Target. And, and I really, I really like that company. What, what is exciting you right now? What are you working on that um, you can't wait to show to the world? Oh, that's a good question. I'm actually, you know, with, uh, in eight years, you kind of go up and down in, 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 um, you know, you can't stay in an amplified or amped up creative mode all the time. Right. I think I'm in a kind of a, 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 a not a lull, but a, like a, a, a re regrouping or a, a re, you know, sort of a, a, a 
re-entered, you know. It ebbs and flows, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm in an ebb, I would say, right now. But I am. Um, I have been approached by a a book, a book agent to do a book, and I've been thinking about that for a couple of years, and it makes a lot of sense. So, um, a coffee table book with all your images, boy, that would be beautiful, I'm sure. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. It it's a, it would it's a not, an obvious fit. The only the only reason I say I'm in the ebb, and the only reason I'm not sort of like she's ready to go. The only reason I'm not ready to go is that. I have been doing this for eight years. I now have three to 5,000 images and to start to sort, do sort it is an overwhelming task. So <laughs> I'm, I have to get over the hump somehow. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Um, everybody, I can't even explain why I can't get started. Every, all my friends, you know, my friends, my husband, the, the agent, they're all like, just pick your hundred favorite images. And I'm like, there's, 3,000. I can't, you know what I mean? Like, and, the, and there isn't a, the irony isn't there isn't a hundred favorites, you know. You could, you could maybe crowdsource some of that, um, some, some of that. You could maybe publish the, the images and, and put up a poll of some sort and ask people who are following you to pick their favorites. That's very interesting. I, I absolutely could, but I've been selling images for eight years, so I know what people like. Okay, people like rainbows. <laughs> I like if I if I do a rainbow of fall leaves, people love. It. If I do, if I take dried flowers and arrange them in sort of a gradient of people like gradients. They like rainbows. They like you know. There's certain things people likes, and but that's not necessarily what I like. And I you know I'm trying to. Part of what I could probably pick the hundred most popular on, based on Instagram and Pinterest feedback, um, but that wouldn't be true to me. That's and, right. And that's where I'm wrestling with is I am a, I'm a min, I'm a minimalist. If you look at still, um, well, so you know, sometimes I get a, a well, whatever. I, the ones that are the most true to me are the ones that are the most spare. And they tend to be desaturated, um, mm -hmm. very minimal, very uncluttered, lots of white space. But that's a very personal thing that I don't think would sell a bunch of books. Mm -hmm. So I'm wrestling with how much, you know, is it is it my personal expression or is it, yeah, I, whatever. It, you can see where I'm struggling. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're, this is the creative process that you're struggling through. This is it, right? Right. So if anybody out there wants to just come and, and make those decisions for me, I have my <laughs> right? I want a really, really good, like I want West Elm right now. I want somebody to come in and just say, we're going to look at your portfolio and we'll make the decisions and you approve or don't approve. That's probably what I'm waiting for. I, I, I wish you luck with that. Maybe that'll, maybe that'll happen. <laughs> It's been so great to talk to you and to spend your and to spend my time with you this this day. Um, is there any final thought you have for our listeners? Someone from someone who's uh, experienced so much in engineering and someone who's been so creative. You know, um, I, I appreciate this talk. It's been super fun. I um, I think you know it's funny because I started the, pie, the 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 hour by saying that I was the born in sixty four, which is the end of the. Baby the end boomers. of the baby boomers, and yet in some way my careers turned out very typical of today's, you know, today's millennials and Gen Xs, mm -hmm. and yeah, it, it, where I, you know, I, I I traded sort of traditional career security and career success for a a, a more a, a life, you know, yeah. um, a more balanced life, a more filling life. And I, and it did, you know, there was financial cost at that for sure. And part of the reason I could do that is that I was lucky enough to have saved money young. So I had the financial security to make those choices later in life. And that would be one, one takeaway, um, I think for that. And then, you know, my husband and I, about 10 years ago, one final thought, I guess, is that we, you've heard the expression, you know, what if, Mm -hmm. And a couple, about 10 years ago, my husband was taking a continuing education class and the, the, the coach at the class or the teacher at the class said, don't ask yourself, what if, ask yourself, what would it take? And it was a funny little switch that flipped for both of us. And suddenly, instead of, wouldn't it be nice to go to France someday, became, what would it take to go to France and put the kids in school? 
And that's a imp really subtle but important shift. And that's made, I guess, all the difference for us. That's a wonderful nugget of wisdom. Like, what would it take? It's just so subtle but so empowering. Right. It's, an, it's incredibly effective, right? Suddenly, suddenly you're being very practical and, and it's amazing how quickly pieces do fall into place once you change that mind sh mindset from, you know, really from passive to active. This has been a blast. I hope people find some takeaways um, and, and find it inspiring. I'm sure they will. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. It's been wonderful and a great pleasure talking to you. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Mary Jo Hoffman is creator of Still, a blog that posts one image daily of gathered natural objects. You can find her work on stillblog.net. And you should also follow her on Instagram at Mary Jo Hoffman. And she's on Pinterest as well. You've been listening to the 107 podcast. Find us online at 107.com slash podcast. And if you have a second, do send us a message. We love hearing from you. Our email address is podcast at 107.com. Until next time, this is Ivan Stegich. Thanks for listening.